welcome, welcome. I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Unpopular Podcast. This is the man, the myth, the legend, Jalen Hunter. If you do me a favor, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm trying to reach a thousand subscribers, so anything will help. But here's where we'll start. We'll start with the biggest news and the biggest, I guess, bombshell that hit last night, and that is Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, getting hurt. And the Bucks, first and foremost, the Bucks tied the series up 2-2 last night and it they destroyed the bucks like they they destroyed the bucks but that's not the biggest story the biggest story is one the Atlanta Hawks didn't have Trey Young Trey Young was out with a bruised bone after he accidentally stepped on the ref's uh foot in what game 3 I believe and he didn't play game 4 but this, you know, first and foremost, injuries suck, man. We, we've we been talking about this all year from AD to LeBron to, to Steph was out a couple games. KD, pretty much all of Brooklyn. In fact, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why Brooklyn lost to uh, to the Bucks was because Kyrie was out. Um, but injuries, injuries suck. But injuries is a part of the game, you know. Uh, if you look back on all the the champion the past champions that we've seen, uh, Toronto when they went up against no hell you can go look last year, uh, the Lakers the Lakers were were fairly healthy, um, and and you know they played they played a couple teams in the bubbles that weren't like the 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 Heat in the in the finals even though I don't think the Heat would have won if Gordon Dragic was there but Gordon Dragic missed a couple games, Toronto when they beat uh, Golden State. Um, you know, the whole team was out pretty much. Clay Thompson uh, t- tore his ACL. KD wasn't playing, you know. Um, of course, we know about even the, you know, Golden State when they beat the, what, 2015 when they beat the Cleveland Cavaliers, Kyrie and them wasn't out. 2016 when the Cleveland came back from 3-1, Draymond was suspended the game. Bogut was out uh, after, what, game four or five or something like that. And so was Andre Iguodala. So what I'm saying is, Injuries is part of the game, and I'm not saying that to justify or to minimize any injury. I I pray that Giannis is able to get back right. I pr- hold up. Oh, I'm sorry. I I totally forgot. For for people watching, for people watching, I know you you're probably wondering. Wait a second, Jay. Why is your your right side a lot brighter than it usually is? Well, first and foremost, shout out to my girl Brittany. She got me a a, a sign. The unpopular podcast that Jones kind of tough, so I had to retire the Allen Iverson uh, jersey. You know, I only got one jersey hanging up in my entire house, and that is Kobe, R.P. Kobe. It was Kobe and Iverson, but now it's unpopular podcast sign. For the people that's listening, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to come to the YouTube to look at it. But hey, boom, boom. back to the story. Um, yeah, man, injuries suck, and whew, so. Injury, I'll say this. Giannis hyperextended his knee, and it's not really looking good for game, what, five? I mean, Giannis could come back, but how bad, how gruesome it looked, um, hopefully it's so, you know, I've hyperextended my knee before. Now, of course, I'm not a world-class athlete, and I'm not playing basketball uh, professionally, but I wasn't good in two days. Uh, So I hope that Giannis is able to come back sometime in the playoffs. But I started off with injuries because, of course, Giannis and Trey Young. But the Bucs is a completely different team without Giannis. As we saw in game four, the Atlanta Hawks is a better overall team. Or let me say this. Yeah, the Atlanta Hawks are a better overall team than the Bucs, in my opinion. Now, I know I wasn't one of those people that went, I was late to the party. I didn't want to admit it. But when you look at the team, you got Lou Williams, you got Gallinari, you got Kevin Herter playing good, you got Bondanovich, you got Cam Cam Reddish, who came back and had a big game. You got John Collins. You got, uh, what's his name, Solomon Hill coming off the bench. The Atlanta has pieces, and of course, Lou Will, I don't remember if I've said him or not. Lou Will, like, as a team, the Atlanta Hawks are better than the Bucks. Now, it's hard for me to say that, especially when you see, you know, 
Giannis and, and Chris Middleton and, and Drew Holiday and, and P.J. Tucker and Brooke Lopez. But the Bucks, man, the Bucks. I just, I don't, you know, the, look, the one reason why I don't understand the Bucks is because they should have a better team than the Atlanta Hawks. And they actually, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> they might have a better team than the Atlanta Hawks, but they're not playing like a better team. And I say that to say Giannis not being there changes the complexion of the whole series. Now, I understand, of course, Giannis not being there changes the complexion of the whole series. I mean, he's a two-time MVP, defense, defensive player of the year, um, all defense, all NBA. I, we know who Giannis is. And, of course, Giannis not being on the Bucks is more impactful than Trey Young not being on the Atlanta Hawks. However, it's a drastic difference from Giannis not being on the Bucks to Trey Young not being on the Hawks. And we saw it last night. We saw that the Atlanta Hawks, they're, they're a young team. They're led by Nate, Nate McMillan, which is their coach. But, you know, Ty, I mean, Ty, oh, what's his name? Lou Williams can have a great game. Cam Reddish can have a really good game. Ke, uh, Kevin Herter can have a good game. Gallinari can have a good game. Clint Capella can still protect the paint. The team is not the the Atlanta Hawks is built around they're they're built around Trey Young, but they have pieces that can carry them. I don't know if they don't have pieces that can carry them over the top as far as like winning championship. But they have pieces that can carry them to a win. The Bucks are completely, and I mean completely, built around Giannis. Now, that's no disrespect to Drew Holiday. That's no disrespect to, to, to P.J. Tucker, to Brooke Lopez, to Chris Middleton. But they're solely built around Giannis. And if there's no Giannis, then... I don't see them winning. You know what? I'll say this. And we'll talk about Paul George in a second, but this is why let's let me let me talk about Chris Milton for a second. I know I kind of sound scared a little bit, but let me talk about Chris Milton for a second. The same reason why I'm going to talk about Paul George in a second. The same reason why I'm get, I get so frustrated at Paul George is the same reason I get so frustrated at at Chris Milton. The other night Chris Middleton, what, had 38? Um, damn near unstoppable. In fact, he had a pretty bad first half. But the second half, he went crazy. 38 points was a big reason why the Bucks won game, what, three? And Chris Middleton looked like a superstar. Chris Middleton looked like he could be the leader of a team. He looks like when Chris Middleton plays like he does in game three, the Bucks are unstoppable, whether you have Giannis or not, because Chris Middleton has a long frame. He has long arms. He has a long wingspan. He can shoot the three. He can shoot the mid-range. He's a mid-range specialist. Chris Middleton has all the pieces and all the skill to be a superstar except one thing and that's the same thing Paul George has and we'll talk about that in a second but he as in Chris Middleton is not consistent and you don't believe me look at game four Chris Middleton in game three scores a whopping 38 points incredible incredible 38 points can't be stopped in game four, he scores, what, 16 points? And, and, and the worst part about it is when Giannis goes down, you expect, you know, next man up. Uh, and your next man is Chris Milton, who you hope, you pay all that money to, you hope can get you over the promised land against a Hawks team that you should, on paper, be better than. Yet and still, Chris Middleton, what, finished the game 6 for 17, 0 for 7 from the three-point line with 16 points. You see, the reason why you can't, uh, the reason why there's so many skeptics and there's so many people that 
question how good Chris Middleton is is because of his inconsistency. Because we know as basketball fans, as, as, as avid basketball watchers, we know how good Chris Middleton could be and has shown flashes. Hell, you remember what? I think it was game like one or I think it was game three. Game three of the of when they played Brooklyn in the second round. Giannis and Chris Middleton, I think at both at halftime had over 30 points. That's that's how good Chris Middleton can be. He had 38 in game three and then turns that around and has 16 with a, a negative 25 net rating. And what's worse about the whole thing is the Bucks need him now, like need him to be a number one, at least until if Giannis comes back, because the knee injury looked pretty bad. Now, I hope that it's just a hyper, not not a serious hyper extension. I hope, you know, he's able to come back sometime in the playoffs. But the Bucks just look. Now, I'll say this. It could just be, I mean, once you see your star player or once you see uh, a very key player get hurt, and go out that that can either do one or two things it can suck the sale out of the entire team and it's like all right i mean let's just chalk it up i don't even feel like playing no more let's you know let's just let's just get out of this game what we're more than likely we're going to win or lose it is what it is let's just get out of this game it can suck the life out of a team or can you can rally against it oh i mean you can rally up like oh no we got to win for Giannis, or we got to win for whoever's injured Clearly, the Bucks just said, "Chop it up. We're we're not going to win this game. It is what it is." Yeah, nah. And the series is tied two two right now. And the thing is, I don't know if the Bucks are going to win this series. It all depends on Giannis's Giannis's injury, but. I can't negate and I can't I can't forget what I saw even with Giannis on the floor. They were getting they were getting ran off the floor with with Giannis even on the court in game what four. And that should not be the case when they're uh, when when the Atlanta Hawks are down their best player. This should not you should not be down what 13 at halftime and when Giannis goes down you're down 15. Giannis misses or airballs two free throws and a shot. Hell, Kenny, Kenny Smith said it at halftime. No NBA player should airball three times in one game. This is why Charles Barkley, and I, I, I'm sorry if, if it sounds like I'm killing the Bucks, but this is why Charles Barkley, hey, actually, I got Forrest Green on too. Go get your own pop of the podcast merch. <laughs> but this is why Charles said that, um, this is why he's, the, the Bucks are so frustrating. Because the Bucks should the Bucks should be clear cut favorites to win the championship. You have Giannis, you have Chris Middleton, which pretty much outside of probably Chris Paul and Devin Booker might be the best one two punch right now in the playoffs with Kawhi because Kawhi Leonard's out. But yet you're in a dog fight with the Atlanta Hawks, the same Atlanta Hawks that were below 500 at the at at All Star break. Now, again, shouts out to Atlanta Hawks. I'm not I'm not bashing you or anything, but the 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 Bucks should not be in a dog fight. Should not be down 2-2 two, 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 or should not be tied up 2-2 two, two with the Atlanta Hawks. The Atlanta Hawks that's been that's been that's been uh you know, like betters and stuff. They've been betted to lose every single series. Now, shouts out for them for winning, but the Atlanta Hawks should not be posing so much of a threat to you, especially with a two-time MVP, uh, two All-NBA defensive players, a former All-NBA all defensive player, and, and P.J. Tucker. It's, it's just, look, oh my gosh, and don't get me started with how bad Brook Lopez has been this entire series. Oh man, Brook Lopez looks like Brooks Lopez looks like somebody that plays at at LA Fitness series, bro. I don't know. I hope you know. I'm not here to bash anybody. Hell, the Milwaukee Bucks could very well go on and win this series and and destroy whoever they see in in the in the NBA Finals. Uh, 
But I will say this. If the Bucks lose this series, I don't think I, I don't think I'm not gonna say never because Giannis is only what 24, 25, one of them two. But I will say this. If they do not win this series, it's hard for me to 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 envision them winning a championship in the very in 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 the near future at all. Because this and this is the same thing I said about uh about Philly. This is the prime you look <clears throat> The Bucks didn't have to see Philly. They didn't have to see Joel Embiid. They didn't have to see. Uh, they didn't have to see Ben Simmons. They didn't have to see the Knicks, especially the Knicks this year. They then they pretty much beat their hardest opponent, and that's because their hardest opponent, which was the Brooklyn Nets, were wounded. You remember the first two games when Kyrie Irving was perfectly healthy. They they got blown off the floor. And this was Kyrie without James Harden. Because James Harden went out, what, the first five seconds pretty much of the playoffs or of the series? And that's the thing, man. I do, it's just it's just hard for me to to see and not to uh, – okay, so let's, let's say moving forward. Let's say next year they do make the playoffs. I mean, they do make the, the NBA Finals because I, I think they're good enough to make the playoffs. You have Giannis. You make the playoffs. Look who you didn't. Let's, let's say you make the finals. Let's say you make the finals next year. Look at the people that you didn't have to or you don't, you wouldn't have to worry about in the finals or this year that you, wouldn't, that you might have to worry about next year. Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Damian Lillard, Jamal Murray, uh, Nikola Jokic, um, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, CP3, Devin Booker. Like, you have you have a gauntlet to run through. And and as as unfortunate as injuries are, injuries are a part of the game, but the 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 sea should be wide open right now for the Bucks because your hardest opponent one was wounded, which is the Brooklyn Nets in the East. Your second hardest opponent, which was the Philadelphia 76ers, you didn't even have to play thanks to the Atlanta Hawks. I don't know, man. I don't know. I will say this. Oh, man. I mm. I hope Giannis I hope Giannis is okay. You know. I, I again I know I've had a hyperextended knee. Uh, I I know how painful that is in the moment. I know it, it did look good that he was able to, at least for a little bit, walk on his own power and uh, or walk him walk by himself pretty much. And he he came back to the to the bench. Now I think after he came back to the bench, he went back to start getting treatment and everything. So I pray that Giannis is able to to be okay. I hope it's not as serious. I hope it's not more serious than the initial hyperextended knee, you know. Um, also, I hope Trey Young's okay. I hope he's able to get back from the bone bruise. I know the thing of, you know, people's like, it's just a bone bruise. Bone bruises hurt. Bone bruise. I've had a bone bruise as well. That's, that that joint ain't, no, ain't, ain't nothing to play with because it, it, it's like pressure and, and it hurts every time you walk. So, I just I just hope that both stars are able to get back right. But even without Giannis, man, even without Giannis, the Bucks should be the Bucks should be favored to win this series, but I don't I, I think without Giannis, it's up in the air. And boy, don't let them get Giannis. Don't I mean don't let the Atlanta Hawks get Trey Young back at hundred percent and you don't have Giannis. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's tough. It's tough, man. But moving forward, and like I said, we, we, we were going to talk about Paul George, and, and we'll talk about Paul George. First and foremost, congratulations to Paul George and the Clippers for winning game, what, five? Winning game five. Uh, they're still down the series 3-2. We're going to see what they do tonight. And shouts out to Paul George for having his – uh, career high in 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 the playoffs. Shouts out to you. 
Shouts out to to Marcus Morris or Markeith Morris. I'm on to y'all. I'm on to y'all. Like I've watched. Look, we know that you switching you switching bodies. We know you guys are identical twins. You guys, <laughs> you guys have the same tattoos, like the exact same tattoos. You guys have, have the exact same beard. We know that you got. There should be no reason why Marcus Morris looks fresher as the playoffs are going down. We we know what's happening. We we know it's cool. It's cool. I'm not gonna say nothing. I know I just said something, but I'm not gonna say nothing to to Adam Silver or I'm not gonna say nothing. I ain't no snitch. But we know what's happening, my guy. But shouts out to the Morris twins <laughs> for for uh shooting the lights out game five. Shouts out to Reggie Jackson who's having probably the best playoff or best stretch of basketball he's ever had since probably college. Um I know he's going to warrant some money and watch a team like the Bulls or something pay for him. <laughs> but um, let's get back to Paul George. So Paul George scores a career high, a playoff career high, 41 points. But like Chris Middleton, Paul George infuriates me. And let's just stick to game five. I'm not going to talk about the entire series. I don't need to talk about the entire series. Let's just talk about game five. First half of game five, Paul George was playing like they're up 3-1. <laughs> they're playing like he's playing like lackadaisical. He's throwing the ball everywhere. He's throwing the ball like there's no defenders. Um, he's He's passing up wide open shots even though the best player on the team, which is Kawhi Leonard, is not there, so you need to be the one to take the shots. He's allowing whatever Moore's twin is playing at the time. Take all the damn shots. It's it's like he played so last, lackadaisical, and he played like he, did, he didn't even care if they won or lost in the first half. And I, I tweeted, I said, look, yes, they're up. The Clippers are up. But it's it's a bad thing when Marcus Morris is being more aggressive than Paul George. And Paul George, with Kawhi Leonard being out, is their best player. You see, I said it last episode, and it's like when your best player is out, or, or, or when you're the best player on a team at this point, efficiency does not matter. You just have to get shots up. You're if you're a great player, they're gonna fall. Look at look at KD. Well, no, no, that's a different story. KD's just KD's just on another level. But look at stars just just get shots up. You're gonna you're gonna score. You're 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 that player. But when you don't even look like you're passionate enough to 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 pass or to shoot the ball. But then what happened next 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 or the second half? He just went crazy. The Paul George that we were expecting to see in game in, in the first half, we saw in the second half. And, of course, I think he scored 20 points in the third quarter, and they finished with 41. Now, I could understand. I understand he's played the most minutes in the playoffs. He was pacing himself. But there's a difference between pacing yourself and just coasting. You can coast in the regular season. Bro, you're down 3-1 at the time. You're, hell, you're down 3-2. Now, of course, we're going to see what happens tonight. But And I understand you're trying to pace yourself because at the end of game, what, four, they he was his legs was tired. He, he just couldn't. He couldn't throw. Nobody could throw a rock in the ocean. So I, I understand him trying to pace himself. But you're down 3-1 at the time in the series. Paul George infuriates me so much because he has the talent to be a superstar. Hell, he's a superstar in the regular season. You can argue he's a top 10 player at times in the regular season. But when we get to the playoffs, my guy, when we get to the playoffs, he you don't know which Paul George you're going to get. Now, I understand Basketball is a tough sport. I know. But, like, it's not the fact that you miss shots. I mean, I get it. You're not going to you're not gonna hit every shot you take. But Paul George be having some, see, like, his seesaws are crazy. One game, he'll have 41 points. Next game, and, and again, I'm not predicting what happens tonight. I don't know. 
Um, but the next game, he'll have 15 or 21, but he'll shoot four for 30. It just, I just need, Paul George has the skill set to be a, a consistent top 10 player. He just isn't. Nobody will put him in the top 10 because of his inconsistency. And I just, so the Clippers are down 3-2 in the series. And I don't, I don't foresee them coming back. I don't see that happening. I don't, I don't. Because with a team led by Chris Paul, Devin Booker playing better uh, as he's getting adjusted to the mask, uh, Cameron Payne, he hasn't really looked good since the ankle injury, but, you know, I give him more time. I think he's going to come back. Torrey and Craig was huge, and even though they lost, he was huge in game, in, in game four and five. Jay Crowder, we know who Jay Crowder is, so I don't know. I just don't – I think – I know that the team, as in the Clippers, have come back from a couple two oh two deficits, but it's different being down three one. Now I understand Chris Paul does not have the greatest history of being up three one, but I just uh, I just or three two when I think about it. But I just I just I don't see the Clippers coming. Now I could if I'm wrong, of course I don't mind coming on here and saying I'm wrong, but I just I just don't see it, man. It's it's tough for me to envision. Um, envision the Clippers winning what at this point two more two straight well it will be three straight I just don't see it. especially you know I know they're going to be at home tonight and then of course we'll have to see you know but I, I think this game I think the series is over tonight honestly and that's no slight against I mean this is you're missing your best player and like I said you don't know what you're going to get from Paul George I will say this if you get the the forty one or if you get the Paul George you got in game five, they can definitely win this series. Or they can definitely win this game. And if you get the Paul George from game five and the rest of the series, they can win the series. However, everyone in their mama knows that's a tall task because we haven't seen a consistent Paul George in the playoffs since Indy. And that's been a while. So, you know, I, I think that the Clippers lose tonight and uh, the Phoenix Suns will be in the NBA Finals. And I think I think for the for the for the Bucks, you know, it it really depends on Giannis's in Giannis's health. I think if Giannis can't play uh for the rest of the series then it's over with for the Bucks. Even though you have Chris Middleton, and I could be wrong again, but even though you have Chris Middleton, you have Brooke Lopez, you have Drew Holiday, it's over for the Bucks Because that team, Drew Holiday, quite as a cap, has not really had a good playoffs this year, even though I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Drew Holiday, like, like cha I champion Drew Holiday a lot. But he hasn't had a good playoffs. Um, Chris Middleton has been as inconsistent as Paul George. Brooke Lopez has played like uh, oh God, he's played like somebody that you play in the at the black top with boots. It's it's just PJ Tucker has played like a, a juiced up version of Patrick Beverly. Both garbage. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. This has been a fun playoffs though, but I don't. I think both series. Are, mm. I think the Bucks series is up in the air. I think the Clippers are gonna, or I think the 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 Suns are gonna kind of get right tonight and kind of kind of take it home. But let's move forward. So Chauncey Billups, shouts out to Chauncey Billups for becoming. I said last episode, Jason Kidd was the head coach, uh, or the became the new head coach of Portland. I misspoke. I meant the Maver. I meant the uh, the Mavs. I, I did not mean Portland. Portland was still up in the air. I apologize. I meant Jason Kidd was the new head coach of the Dallas Mavericks. Chauncey Billups is now the new head coach of the Portland Trailblazers. Shouts out to Chauncey, man. Uh, you know, Chauncey Billups, we all know him as Big Shot or Big B Billups. Uh, what he did in in Detroit, of course, uh, and I think he's well deserved. Now, I, this is the first time 
ever in my entire life that I think I kind of went or rooted against the black person <laughs> for the first time ever. I kind of I kind of wanted Becky Hammond to, to get this spot. I think it's time, you know, it's, it's time to break that barrier. I think the, in the world that we're living in and with the type of players that we have, I think it's time to have a, have a woman head coach. I, I think that women are as knowledgeable, if not more knowledgeable in some areas in the game. And I think that, I think players these days, you know, they don't really care who leads them. If they, they just care if you're knowledgeable about the sport, if you have their best interests at heart, and if you know what you're talking about. So I'm not upset with Chauncey Billups getting the head coaching job. Uh, of course, I would I love to see my African American brothers and sisters get in positions that usually is scarce for a lot of people. Um, shouts out to him. But I think this is the first time uh, in in my entire life that I rooted. I'm I'm kind of I wish that Becky Hammond would have got this spot. I wish that Becky Hammond would have uh what would have been would have been considered more i know i know we heard that she was in the final stages of the the hiring process but i just i you know i just wish becky hammond would have got that spot but shouts out to chauncey bellis man well deserved i think i think that he's gonna go along well with the team as you're starting to see even with um ame udo or yeah, Udo, the new coach of the, the the Boston Celtics, teams are starting to go a little younger as far as coaches because you want people to that can connect with your players. This is a new age of of coaching. There's no more. I'm not gonna say there's no more. You know, tyrant coaches like a Stan Van Gundy, like a like a uh, like a I don't know. There's no more tyrant type coaches of you do what I say hard practices stuff like that which is why I was so surprised that Tom Thibodeau worked for for the Knicks because I think that's just an outlier because again it's kind of hard when you you're not that much of a people's person outside of the court um so you know shouts out to Chauncey and and, and well deserved I, I wish nothing but the best Again, I, I love to see my African American brothers and sisters get into positions that usually is not they're not really considered for or they're put in a tough situation. Like usually African American coaches are put in situations like rebuild situations or situations where they're like like uh what David Cully, the 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 head coach for the Houston Texans, that's a lose lose situation. I feel horrible for him. Um, you know. Brian Flores for the for the for the Miami Dolphins, they tried everything and they powered it to to sabotage him. They just didn't understand he's a great coach and he was able to turn that franchise around. So black people usually are put in situations, put in lose lose situations, and they have to they they're pretty much built. I mean not built. They're pretty much set up to fail. Um, but I think that uh you know I think. Being under the tutelage of Ty Lue, which is an incredible coach. And I I apologize to Ty Lue. I'm going to do that now. I apologize, Ty Lue. I was one of those people that I was really skeptical of Ty Lue. Because I was one of those people to say, hey, I mean, he's the only success he had was with LeBron James. And, I mean, I'm sure if I coached, uh, if I coached a series with LeBron, I can get, I can get him to the NBA Finals. And I was I was one of the people that say you know Ty Lue is just is is overhyped. I mean you see what happened when he when when Cleveland didn't have LeBron and they fired Ty Lue because they were trash. But I apologize to Ty Lue. Ty Lue is an incredible coach. His his ability to to you know his ability to to make adjustments on the fly, make adjustments mid game, make adjustments from quarter to quarter. He's he's an incredible incredible coach, and I apologize to you, Ty Lue. And with Chauncey Billups, who is under his coaching staff right now, with Chauncey Billups getting you know under the tutelage of Ty Lue, I think he's going to be an incredible incredible fit for Portland. But with with 
Chauncey Billups coming to Portland. The question that presents itself. We heard, we're hearing um, we're hearing rumblings about Damian Lillard may or may not request a trade. And of course, his stint, you know, Damian Lillard has been playing for the league, playing in Portland his entire career and his entire career Portland has 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 done a piss poor job in getting help around him. I understand that you can say, but what about CJ McCollum? What about Mello? What about Enos Cantor? What about Nurkic? What about Robert Covington? What? No. <laughs> Damian Lillard. You know the question the question is this. Do should should loyalty matter in sports? And the question presents itself because when you you really only hear about loyalty with players as far as players and an organization, not an organization and players. Because at the end of the day, no player is untouchable. And I said this last episode, and I'll say it again. If 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 Golden State got a call and said Golden State got a call from Brook from Brooklyn and say, yo, what up? And, and they were like, who you want? And they said, all right, you give us Steph Curry. We'll give you James Harden, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. You be crazy to think that Golden State would say no to that. And this is Steph Curry. Three-time champion, three, two-time MVP, first and only unanimous, the greatest three-point shooter we've ever seen. They would trade him in a heartbeat if they said you get James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving. No players untouchable. I'm sure if the Lakers got a call today, Lakers got a call from, let's, let's say, Lakers got a call from the Nuggets. And say, yo, talk to me. They say, you give us LeBron, we'll give you Jamal Murray and Nicole, Nicole Jokic. The MVP, Nicole Jokic. They'd be like, all you need is LeBron? Bet. Boom. LeBron's gone. Now, I understand the no trade clause or anything, but I'm just saying. No player is untouchable. And organizations are always going to now. I understand that the M, the NBA, a little more so than the NFL, is more of a players' league, and they understand that the players drive the fandom, players drive the the viewership, players drive the 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 popularity of the sport. But no player is un, is is untouchable. Hell, let's look at what we're to, what, what's happening in Washington right now. All, all you hearing is Bradley Bill wants to stay. Bradley Bill wants to stay. Bradley Bill wants to stay. And then all you're hearing from the media and, and front offices is, well, Bradley Bill might be available. Bradley Bill might be available. Like, anytime we talk about loyalty, it's always the player is loyal to the team. Steph Curry will never want to request a trade from Golden State. Damian Lillard will never want to request a trade from Portland. So the question is, should Damian Lillard request a trade? I say this. The worst thing that could happen to Portland right now is exactly what is happening to Portland right now. And that is Damian Lillard playing for Team USA. I used to work at Taco Bell. I used to work at Taco Bell I used to be flipping uh, chalupas everywhere. I used to I used to be the number one Taco Bell employee until I got a taste of NBC. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to go back to that. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with working at a fast food place, a retail place. Nothing wrong with that. But when you get a taste, when, when you get a call and say, yo, Jay, 
we want you to work the NBA Finals. I'm like, ah, it's kind of hard for me to go back to, to, to McDonald's. Again, nothing wrong. A job is a job. Go get your money. I'm just saying, when you have been in, you know, it is, think of it as an airplane. When you flown, when you flown, like, flown regular, regular seats, and then you get that one taste of first class, it's kind of hard to look back and think, ah, I'm going to go back there now. Damian Lillard is playing for Team USA. Listen to some of the names he's playing with. First of all, listen to some of the names he's playing with compared to the names he's played with his entire career. Team USA, he's going to play alongside Bam Adebayo, Bradley Bill, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Jeremy Grant, Draymond Green, Drew Holiday, Zach Levine, Kevin Love, Chris Middleton, and Jason Tatum. I'm going to just tell you right now, spoiler alert, Bam out of bio, um, you can kind of say maybe prime Jamal, uh, out, outside LaMarcus Aldridge, Bam out of bio is better than anybody that Damian Lewis played with. Bradley Bill is better than anybody Damian Lewis ever played with. Kevin, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Draymond Green, Drew Holiday, Zach Levine, Chris Middleton, and Jason Tatum are better than anybody Damian Lillard has played with. So the last thing Portland wants to do, which is going to, which is happening, is Damian Lillard plays with talent. Then he goes back to Anthony Simon. Don't get me wrong; these are all NBA players. Shouts out to y'all, but it's kind of hard throwing a pass to Kevin Durant. Oh, let me say this. It's kind of hard when you have Kevin Durant on the one wing and Jason Tatum on the other wing, and then you go back home and you have CJ McCollum who doesn't know the diameters of the court, and you have what? Enos Cantor, who's only good for rebounding and offense. That's a lie. Rebounding and putbacks. It's kind of hard when you have. When, you sh- when you're going to share a backcourt with Bradley Bill, who finished second in scoring, to go back to C.J. McCollum, who's damn near on the same level as Paul George as far as inconsistency. So do I think Brad- do I think Damian Lillard should request a trade? I say this. You have to do what's best for your career. At the end of the day, nobody talks about how great Charles Barkley was. Charles Barkley arguably could possibly be a top 20 player to ever play this play the sport of basketball. But they're not going to talk about that. All they talk about is, well, he didn't win a ring. Even though Carl Malone is a dirty trifling dude, like dirty trifling. Just go, you can you can Google Carl Malone and look at his past. We'll just stick to the basketball side. No, you know what? Let me not even talk. I don't even want to talk about Carl Malone. I'm sorry. I'm not talking about Carl Malone. Let's talk about John Stockton. Arguably one of the greatest point guards to ever play. They're not gonna say that, well, I mean, he didn't win a ring. Hell, look at look at how they talk about Melo. Shouts out to Melo for winning the first uh what Karima Du Jabbar Social Activist Award. Shouts out to you, man. But look how they talk about Melo. Damian Lillard, you don't I say this before. Players don't players don't spend their whole offseason working out and running in sand and doing boxing lessons and running sprints and being in a hot ass gym with no fan and no AC all summer just to just to not even make the playoffs or get bounced four out of the five times in the first round. Especially when you're as good as Damian Lillard and the last game or the game before the last game you drop fifty five points and you still lose. Here, look, I'm not here to say what to do and what not to do. As 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 far as if you should uh, demand a trade or should not. I will say this. Do what's best for your career. 
It hasn't seen because because Portland's always going to do what's best for them. But I said this before: incompetence incompetency lasts as long because either a you don't know how to get out of it, or you don't know that you're incompetent, or b there's no way to get out of it. And Portland gets in their way the since 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 uh, what's his name since Clyde Drexler. They're, they've had the same problem year after year after year. They focus solely on offense and not on the defense. And now the worst part is Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum's their only offense, and they don't have defense. So I'm not here to tell you what to do, Dane. But I will say this. The organization is always going to do what's best for them. Whether you want to preach loyalty or not, and no, no player is untouchable. You don't believe me? Look at what happened with James Harden at OKC. They get to an NBA Finals. James Harden is by far. Now they do lose, of course, to Miami, but James Harden is by far the best six man in the in in the league. In fact, I think he won a six man of the year. I think one of the only players in NBA history, I could be wrong, but I think he's one of the only players in NBA history, if not the only player in NBA history, to win a six-man of the year award and a MVP, I believe. They traded him for Kevin Martin to the Rockets for $3 million. Not $3 million annually, $3 million. Now, understand for my for for people like me, three million dollars is life changing. But for the NBA, it's, it's three million dollars. Hell, I think I think uh, Demarcus Cousins has accumulated over three hundred three million dollars his his entire career in tax and fines. All I'm saying, Dame, I know you're probably listening. I mean, this is this is a, I know you're listening. Just do what's best for you, man. Because the organization is always going to do what's best for them, no matter if you like it or not. So, hell, ask DeMar DeRozan. That man, all he talked about was wanting to stay with the, the, all he wanted to do was stay with, with Toronto. But of course, like I said, Toronto got that call. Hey, yo. I mean, no. The Spurs made that call. Hey, yo, you want Kawhi? Just give us DeMar. Like, ah, Kawhi? Leonard? Yeah, I'm sorry, DeMar. It's over with. That's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move forward. So last episode, I uh, we talked about the collapse of um, the Philadelphia 76ers, in particular, Ben Simmons. And I suggested that Ben Simmons may need to be traded or could be traded. Now, I know reports are saying that the Philadelphia 76ers are committed to Ben Simmons long term. I guess. I mean, of course, you're going to say that now because the stock is pretty low. You're probably going to sit on Ben Simmons for a little bit and hope that his stock rises in the regular season, which I don't understand why you would do that, because Ben Simmons has not improved at all since his since college so but all right and i suggested last episode that he should be traded i didn't do a good job for the viewers so i apologize what i'm going to do this episode is i'm going to give you five destinations where i think ben simmons could be really good at now first i talked about this last episode but for people that missed it i will say what do you need what ben simmons needs to thrive because what he has now ain't ain't working Ben Simmons cannot be your primary ball handler. He cannot be your primary ball handler because he cannot shoot. And you you can't have, especially in today's NBA, you can't have somebody that's dominating the ball that can't shoot. That's just, they're going to hack, hack him. They're, they're going to keep fouling him. He, he's, 
you're going to be able to double team the next best player because he's not going to give you any offense outside of the paint. You can just wall up because he has no shot whatsoever. And he is god awful from the free throw line. And he is non existent from the three point line. So you cannot have him be your primary ball handler. He needs to be around someone that can A, be a ball handler, and B, be around players that can shoot the ball. Uh,. More like, hopefully, probably the, the problem with Philly is Philly doesn't really have a player that can consistently put the ball on the ground and, and go get them a bucket. Yes, they have Seth Curry, but Seth Curry is not Steph Curry. He's he's not as consistent. Of course, Danny Green, but I mean, no. And Joel Embiid, who is a center. So, Tobias Harris, no. So, and Tobias, shouts out to Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp said it best. Ben Simmons being bad in uh, Philly, Philly Atlanta series kind of overshadowed how bad Tobias Harris was. A man that's making $33 million a year was god-awful. But we're still on Ben Simmons. <laughs> so we're, we're, I'm going to give you five destinations where I think Ben Simmons will thrive. First and foremost, number five, I'm going to give it Washington. Now... The reason why I'm putting Washington at five is because of Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook can't shoot either. Now, he's better at Ben Simmons than shooting, but he can't shoot either. The, I really would like to pair. I, I'm really looking at the pairing between Ben Simmons and Bradley Beal. Bradley, I think, I mean, as we know, I talked about it a couple episodes ago. The Washington defense has, has not been good. And... You getting a two, you know, uh, a player that finished all NBA or all defense, um, first team, finished second in defensive player of the year, and he doesn't have to have the the assignments of being a primary point guard because you have a, a Russell Westbrook. He doesn't have the primary uh, assignment of creating shots for other players because you have Russell Westbrook because you have. Bradley Bill. You can just worry about defense and and rebounding and we good. I think Washington would be a I mean other players around him. I don't I don't know that it'll be a championship team, but I do think he'll be good in Washington. Number 4, I have Portland. <laughs> I know I just talked about Dame, but one thing that we've seen is Portland needs a defender. Like they need someone that plays defense. Now it does not address their biggest issue, of course, which is well, their second biggest issue, which is a reliable second score. Because as we've seen throughout the years, CJ McCollum is not that. But Ben Simmons could definitely help them and will definitely help them defensively better than what they thought Robert Covington was giving them, <laughs> which is not much. Uh, and I think that it kind of gets the ball out of Damian Lillard's hands a lot. I mean, I'm not – Damian Lillard has the ball in his hands a lot. Now, of course, he's the point guard. He's their best player. He's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. But as we saw towards the end of the Denver series, he kind of wears down. Now, I understand he had 55, but, he, you know, you don't want your best player to be so – ball dominant because he has to be it's different if he's ball dominant because he wants to be and that's just the best form like he has to be and I think Ben Simmons will kind of leave the ball handling pressure out of Damian Lillard's hands a little bit so I have Portland at number four number three I have Boston I think him alongside that would be a long team out I mean outside of you have Jalen Brown, you have Jason Tatum, and you have Ben Simmons. Now, that doesn't address that doesn't address Boston's biggest problem, which is they don't really have a score outside of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And as we've kind of seen the last few years, Jason Jalen, while Jalen Brown has improved, he hasn't always been the the most reliable as far as health wise. So it doesn't really address their biggest problem, which is offense, but it does give Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum a third option as far as someone that can create better shots for them. Because also, and that's, I think, one big reason why Kimball Walker is not there anymore. Kimball Walker was supposed to be someone that relieved 
offensive duties from Jason Tatum, offensive duties from Jalen Brown, and he was supposed to be able to set them up a little better to get shots. As we saw with Kemba Walker, he wasn't the best at creating shots for Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. And I think that Ben Simmons, as we've seen him creating shots for players like J uh, Danny Green, Seth Curry, Joel Embiid, I think that'll help Jalen, uh, Jason Tatum's game immensely. Do I think that Ben Simmons is better than Jason Tatum? No, but I do think that he will help Jason Tatum immensely. Number two, I have Brooklyn. I know what, what? I know, but hear me out. What's Brooklyn's biggest problem? They can't defend and save their life. Now, their second biggest problem is not addressed, which is the big man, but they can't defend and save their life. You put a a player that finished second in defensive player, like I, you put Ben Simmons in that in the in the Buck series, even with uh, Kyrie Irving going out. Yeah. And and quite as kept, I might talk about this. Leave in the comments below if you want me to talk about this. Ah, I might have a serious conversation about Kyrie next episode. I might leave in the comments if you want to hear it. But I might have a serious conversation about Kyrie and the Brooklyn Nets. But I think Ben Simmons would be really good for Brooklyn Nets as far as defensively. And number one, I say Golden State Warriors. I say Golden State Warriors because this helps. I think this is the best the best marriage for both teams. I think that Ben Simmons what he's never played with some with two players as now of course we need to see what happens when if Clay, when Klay Thompson gets back, but he's never played with somebody as offensively reliable as a set a Steph Curry and a and a and a Klay Thompson. And he's never played along somebody that kind of does the same thing he does just with more of a tenacity and that is Draymond Green I think of course you're probably gonna have to give up Andrew Wiggins and probably a couple draft picks but you get I this will help to me I think this will help uh Ben Simmons game immensely playing alongside a player like Steph, Steph Curry and, and Clay Thompson. And I'm not saying he was garbage, of course, but KD's game improved when he played alongside Steph and Clay and Draymond Green. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't already all world, but you saw an uptick in everything as far as efficiency, defense, rebounding, assists. Kevin Durant played his best basketball alongside Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and and Klay Thompson. And while I don't think that he's just going to turn into freaking Kevin Durant, I will say that I think Ben Simmons' game has to improve when you play alongside players that good. Not to mention, it helps. It helps. Um, it helps the Golden State Warriors defensively. It helps them, especially have a wing defender that's. The only uh, and, and it helps Clay Thompson a lot as well because Clay Thompson usually is their best on ball defender as far as the guard position, and then you have Draymond Green. But with Clay Thompson coming back from two injuries, I think that Ben Simmons would alleviate a lot of pressure. Now you don't have to put Clay Thompson on the other player's best guard and still expect him to score 30, 25, 35 points, you know. So I think that that marriage would help both of them. So again, the teams I have the best fits for for Ben Simmons would be five Washington, four Portland, three uh, Boston, two Brooklyn, and one Golden State. Now again, I don't know if Ben Simmons is going to be traded. I do think, and it's not just. I think people are over. I'll say this. I think people are going hyperbolic about what they saw in this year's playoffs with Ben Simmons and his his lack of improvement in shooting. But I'm not just pinning it to this year's playoffs. I'm pinning it to what we've seen since college, honestly. The fact that Ben Simmons is the same exact player we've seen since college. 
And this is the same Ben Simmons that pretty much had a year off due to, the, of course, the foot injury where you could have had multiple chances and so much time to work on your game, work on your shooting, and you haven't. It. It's not the fact that he can't shoot. Giannis Antetokounmpo cannot shoot. He can't shoot to save his life. The problem is he is scared to shoot. He does not shoot. Giannis will still shoot threes. Hell, Giannis airball shots, but he's not. that doesn't deter him from shooting again. Giannis is not scared to shoot. Ben Simmons is scared to shoot. He is afraid to shoot. And I think that is the biggest problem, and that is the biggest reason why he should be traded from the 76ers because when the person that is the do, the 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 primary and dominant ball handler for your team is scared to shoot and it's not just shoot from 3 it's not just shoot from mid range he's scared to shoot from the three point line i mean no he's scared to shoot from the three free throw line at that point yes yeah, it's, it's 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 a wrap my guy it's it's a wrap it's a wrap in my opinion I could be wrong, but it's a wrap. But we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Let's move. Let's move forward. Let's let's talk about some WNBA. So the All Star the All Star team or the all some of the All Star reserves should be named today for the WNBA. And for people that do or do not know, the WNBA All Star game is going to be Team USA against uh, All Stars. So. With that being said, there's there's a couple players that aren't going to be on the All-Star team because they're going to be on Team USA. Team USA is Ariel Atkins, Sue Bird, Tina Charles, Nafisa Collier, uh, Skylar Diggins-Smith, Sylvia Fowles, Chelsea Gray, Brittany Griner, Aja Wilson, uh, Diana Taurasi, Brianna Stewart, and Jewel Lloyd. Those are all the players that's going to be on Team USA. Now, the biggest, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest stories coming out of Team USA um, or the announcements of Team USA, the, the, the team, is Neka Abumake not being selected to the Team USA. She's a former MVP. Uh, where the hell is she at? And at first I was like, hold on. Whoa, where's, the, where's Neka? But then I thought, I mean, look at all these players. Comp- NECA has only played what? I think she's only played, um, due to injury, she's only played like five games. Now, I understand her playing five games this year. She's averaging 16 points a game, seven rebounds, and shooting like 58, 59%, which is incredible. But she has only five games this year. And while she's still one of the best players in the WNBA, do not get me wrong, if you look at Team USA, Ariel Atkins is having a career year for Washington. Sue Bird, that's Sue Bird. I mean, she's 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 going to go down in history as one of the greatest uh, players to ever play in basketball. Tina Charles, we'll talk about her in a second, but she's having a historical year. Nafisa, Nafisa Collier, she's having a great year for the uh, the the Lynx. Skylar Diggins Smith, she's she's one of the best guards. Uh, Sylvia Fowles, she's one of the best, if not the best, big man in in the WNBA. Chelsea Gray is having a great year for the Aces. Brittany Griner, I mean that's that's Brittany Griner, she's a monster. Uh, Jewel Lloyd is having the best season of her career. Brianna Stewart, arguably the goat. Um, Dana Taurasi, arguably the GOAT, and the former MVP, Asia Wilson, who's having yet another incredible season. It's just while I'm just like, hold on. I, I get why people are upset that um, that Neko Bumake is not on Team USA and they feel snubbed. And I, again, I, I wouldn't be upset if she was on the team, but after looking at it, and of course you have to do that thing where – well, if if you have to put if you want to put somebody on, you have to take somebody off. I understand now people are kind of saying the fees of Collier, she she could definitely get the boot. I don't know. She's she's had a good season, even though she did miss some time in the early in the in the beginning of the season. I don't know. Some people say, what about Aja Wilson? 
I don't know. I mean, she's still, I don't know. I just, it'll be tough for me to take anybody off for, uh, for NECA. But, but I'm not saying she's not deserving of being on Team USA. I'm just saying I understand why she may not have gone on Team USA. However, I'm gonna pre- I'm gonna s- predict who are, who's gonna make the all the 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 WNBA All Star team. Now it could be wrong. These are my opinions. But after from what we've seen this year, I'm just gonna make some predictions. I'm gonna make I'm gonna predict my 12 woman roster. Uh, some some names are pretty like. There's no way they can't be on t- on the All Star game. Like Liz Cambage from the Aces. I mean, she's in, she's incredible. Uh, John Quell Jones, who is right now, I believe, the front runner for the MVP. She has to be Dewana Bonner. I mean, for the Connecticut Suns, they have the, one of the best records in the league. Candace Parker, we know how important she is to the Chicago Sky. There, of course, she's going to be on here. Uh, I think Neka Bumake is going definitely is going to make the. The, if I'll say this, if she doesn't make the WNBA uh, All Star team, then 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 you should bring you should you should dust you know wipe the dust off your pitchforks and and, and start the marching. But I do think she'll make that. Um, Arike, uh, uh, oh damn! Like they 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 said that people have been messing her name up, and I think I'm gonna do it too. But I apologize, Arike. Aguano Aguanbo Wale. I know I butchered your name and I apologize, but she definitely to me is going to should be a, a an all-star. So right now I have Liz Cambage, John Quell Jones, Dewana Bonner, Candace Parker, uh Neka Bumake, and Arike Ung Arike. I'm gonna just say Arike. I apologize. Those are those are locks. I think uh Courtney Vanderslot, she should be a lock. I mean, she's she's leads the WNBA yet again in assist. Uh, I think she's done that for like past four seasons straight. So she's definitely a lock. Um, who else? Who else? Benaja Laney. Benaja Laney for the for the Liberty has been incredible. She's averaging twenty points a game, shooting fifty percent from the field. And she's one of the biggest reasons alongside, uh, what's her name? Um, and, uh, Nindescu, Nindescu, she, Benazia Laney definitely should be a, a WNBA all-star this year. Um, Courtney Williams, Courtney Williams has been incredible for the Atlanta dream. She, she, it's not only just her de- just her scoring. She averaged what seventeen points a game, but she's been incredible defensively as well, and she's been good with assists. She averages four assists and set and uh, what seven rebounds and for her size, she's not the tallest player ever. She uh and she leads them. She leads them in minutes played, which is like thirty five a game. So you know, Courtney Williams definitely deserves, in my opinion, to be a WNBA All Star. Um. I think Brianna Jones. First of all, shout out to Brianna Jones, Maryland product. Uh, she, I think she deserves to be on this list. Uh, she, she's averaging 18 points a game with shooting 60, 61 percent over the last five games. She, she's been really good. She's been, she's been great for the Connecticut Sun. The Connecticut Sun has been good this entire year. Don't be surprised if they could end up in the WNBA finals. I mean, Dewana Barnes has been good. Uh, John Quell Jones has been good. Brianna Stewart, Brianna Jones has been good. So they they have some they have some players. They have some players. Um, who else? Marnina Marnina Mabry. I, I damn I'm, I'm messing her name up. Mabry Mabry. Yeah, she she's been good too. I think that she she definitely deserves to be a uh to be an all star this year. Um. Mm. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first, first, she's what nineteen points a game, three assists, six rebounds a game. Uh, I, I, I think that she, especially 
in the beginning of the season with um oh what's homegirl's name with uh oh dang what's her what's her name with uh uh uh, uh I forgot home homegirl's name but she was replacing homegirl and I think that she I think that while her role has changed um I think she deserves to be uh to be an all star I also think uh Shandy Carter should should definitely be an all star. So my all star list, I'm just gonna give my ten. Courtney Vanderslot, uh, Benazia Laney, Arike, I'm not gonna butcher your last name. Courtney Williams, Nabuma, uh, Neka Abumake, Marnina Mabry, uh, Shindre. Oh my gosh, Shinati. I'm sorry. Shinetti Carter, Brianna Jones, Candace Parker, Dewana Bonner, John Quell Jones, and Liz Cambage. I think that those should be the ten. I know that there's there's a lot of great names that I didn't say, like uh Dorica Hambry from from uh the Vegas Aces, uh Sammy Whitcomb from the from the Liberty, uh Sabrina Nadescu. I didn't say that, so I know there's there's some really good names, but those are my 12 that I think are going to make the WNBA All-Star team to play against Team USA. I think it's July 14th, I think. Um, And also, before we get off of the WNBA, I want to give a shout-out to Tina Charles. Tina Charles, who is playing for the Washington Mystics, she has a chance to make history. Right now, I be, I could be wrong, but right now I believe she's averaging twenty five points a game, maybe twenty five point three points a game or twenty five point two. And if she finishes the season averaging twenty five point three or more, she will have averaged the most. She will become the highest averaged point woman in WNBA history. Right now, Diana Taurasi holds the record with 25.29. I think currently, I could be wrong, but I think currently, it it may have changed last night uh, since they did lose, but right now I think Tina Charles is currently uh, averaging 25.33 points a game. If that holds up, Tina Charles will be will average the most points in NBA in WNBA history for a season. Um and I think I mean <laughs> that's incredible especially after the injuries that she sustained and and the long road it took to come back. That to me is is yeah, um, and I think she's gonna do it. I think now, now, John Quell jo- or yeah, John Quell Jones right now is probably the front runner in the MVP. But I would say, and and it kind of goes back if you go to the NBA, it kind of goes back to the Steph Curry, um, the Spe- Steph Curry Nikola Jokic argument. Uh, to me, Tina Charles has had the best season this like this year and 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 if you look i mean last night while the miss while the mystics did lose they only had six players available and elena deladon has not played uh tina charles has been there since pretty much day one most of their players outside of tina now i know tina charles has missed maybe a game or two but She's been the most consistent, and this is her 11th season. So I understand Jaquel Jones, she has a better record. The Connecticut Senate, of course, has a better record, and it goes back to Nicole Jokic and Steph Curry. Nicole Jokic played all the games. Um, Dallas, I mean, Denver had a better record than Golden State, but it's kind of hard to look at what we saw in the regular season from Steph Curry and be like, yeah, but because the team record, even though Klay Thompson was out, even though Kelly Oubre missed a lot of time, even though Draymond Green missed some time, even though Steph Curry missed some time, 
ah, you know, Golden State finished seventh or whatever, and that's why he's not MVP. Tina Charles is having one of the best seasons in MB- in WNBA history as far as statistics wise and scoring offense, and the fact that she more than likely won't win the W NBA, you know, MVP is crazy in my opinion. But uh, I did want to give a shout out to uh, Tina Charles. I am rooting for you. Of course, I've been to uh, Mystics game. It was pretty fun. Uh, I'm I'm DMV native, so of course I'm gonna root for all the Washington teams. But and this is no bias when I say this. I if you, you can go look at the stats, Tina Charles is having arguably one of the best or greatest offensive seasons we've ever seen from a single player and I'm rooting for her to average um I'm rooting for her to average uh 25 or more a game now last night she only had 26 so yeah she can definitely do it she could definitely do it and I'm rooting for her man I'm rooting for Tina Charles and shouts out to her that's why she is the cover she's the cover she's the cover artist of this episode so Shouts out to you, Tina Charles. But let's move forward. <laughs> hey, yo, Scotty Pippen been wilding, ain't he? <laughs> Scotty Pippen been going crazy the last few days, man. First and foremost, this really all started with the last dance. The last dance, apparently, he didn't like how he was being depicted. And he felt that it was pretty much a Michael Jordan documentary over a Bulls documentary, but here's the thing. You can't really talk about the Bulls without talking about Michael Jordan. It's Don't get me wrong. I understand that, you know, Michael Jordan didn't really win anything without Scotty, uh, but I also understand how good Michael Jordan is, and I also understand how good Scotty Pippen is. And, of course, Scottie Pippen's wrath did not just stop with The Last Dance. Of course, he has a book coming out. So, you know, he has a lot of interviews up, and he's just going crazy with it. Um, he he talked about Kevin Durant. Uh, you can't compare Kevin Durant to LeBron James. He's nowhere close. I think he said, I think he said one interview that LeBron James, you can't compare me to LeBron. LeBron James isn't even close to me. I'm like, whoa <laughs> like and I and I think yesterday he came out or two days ago he was talking to Dan Patrick I believe and he called Phil Jackson a racist because the infamous play or the infamous game where Scotty Pippen refused to go into a game because uh, Phil Jackson drew up a play for Tony Kukoc over Scotty Pippen to get a shot here's the thing about that Scott Scotty Pippen, yes, he's better than Tony, Tony Kukoc. Scotty Pippen got him there. Scotty Pippen was the best player because this was the year or one of the years where Jordan retired. But the play needed a shooter. And Tony Kukoc was a better shooter than Scotty Pippen. Not to mention, and, and, and for people that don't play play sports, Coaches draw up plays, but and and you want to run the play, but in the heat of the moment, you do what's best for the team. I'm not saying you just scrap coach's play, but the coach's play isn't always gonna go or run how he drew it up. It's you know there's there might be a player that jumps a cut. There might be a player that. Uh, there might be a double screen. I mean, not double screen. There might be a double somewhere on the player that like. You can draw up a play, but you never know how it's going to go down. It's very rare that the play that you draw up goes exactly how it's drew up. Very rare. And I think Scottie Pippen was a decoy. However, Scottie Pippen could, if Scottie Pippen was wide open and shot the ball, and still, and nobody would have been upset. Cause I mean, Scottie Pippen, but Scottie Pippen tripping because you, you you drew up a play for Tony Kukoc, who was a he was a rookie at the time, yes, but he was a better shooter. Then Scottie Pippen and Tony Kukos was going crazy that game. That's one thing Scottie Pippen fails to fails to acknowledge. 
Tony Kukos was going crazy that game. Now, again, uh, Scotty Pippen needs to understand, bro. You weren't the best player on the team. You were a very important player, yes, but you weren't the best player on the team. You can't make a hell. Look at the look at the history of the Bulls before Michael Jordan. Look at the history of the Bulls after Michael Jordan. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Now I understand you had a season where, uh, you know, you had a season where they were pretty much a blown call away for being back in the finals with with Michael Jordan there. But nobody talks about the season after that. The team was garbage. They pretty much imploded. Again, I'm not here saying Scottie Pippen's a bad player because he's not. Scottie Pippen is, is, is arguably top 50 player of all time. I'm not here to bash Scottie Pippen. But Scottie Pippen has to realize, and I know you're listening, Scottie. Scottie Pippen has to realize, my G, you were never that dude. You were never a one, which is okay. You were you were the greatest two ever. But Michael Jordan was the one, bro. Kevin Durant's better than you have ever been. Not defensively, no. But Kevin Durant is better than you. LeBron James is way better than you. Scottie Pippen was a top 50 player of all time. But you have to come come like come down to earth, bro. What are you doing? What are you doing? Let's move forward. Uh I'm gonna stay on this. I'm I'm not gonna stay on this quick. Serena Williams uh was forced to withdraw from Wimbledon uh the match after an ankle injury. Uh it was it was, it looked pretty bad. Um I pray that she, you know, gets gets right. Um you know she I'm not going to stay on this too long. I'm not going to dwell on it. She is the greatest pro she's arguably top 10 greatest athletes we've ever seen, both men and women. Um she's iconic. She is she's on the level of to me when we talk about icons in sports, uh she's on the level with Tiger. She's on the level with uh Michael Jordan. She's on the level with Muhammad Ali back in the day. Serena Williams is a is the goat of tennis both men's and women's and um i hope that you know she's able to recover and and get back to what she wants to do if if we have seen the last of her tenant of uh, playing tennis i'm gonna remember her as the greatest tennis player ever both men and women uh in number the i think the second greatest tennis player ever was probably venus so, uh, shouts out to Serena. I wish nothing but the best for her, and I hope that she recovers. I hope that she has a speedy recovery. I hope that the ankle injury is not that serious. I know that uh, everyone gave her a standing ovation, and she kind of waved at the crowd. So, hopefully, it's not that bad. But um, yeah, uh, I hope I hope nothing but the best for Serena, the greatest tennis player of all time, and arguably one of the top ten greatest athletes we've ever seen both men and women. So, and lastly, the last thing I want to do is shine light on Najee Harris. Najee Harris, uh, who is a rookie for the Pittsburgh Steelers. She was the running back for the Atlanta, Atlanta, for Alabama. He's teaming up with California governor to fight homelessness. Uh, they're trying to put plans together. Um, as we know, Najee Harris had a tough growing, a, a tough upbringing. He was in a couple homeless shelter and homeless shelters, and uh, it was pretty cool for his draft night. Like you know how people go places for draft. His draft, his draft center, I guess, was in one of the homeless shelters that he was in, and of course he get he he's one of the most. You know, we always a lot of times when athletes are in the news or we talk about an athlete it's because they do something crazy or they do something uh, or they get hurt or they accomplish something as far as a championship or something. And it's very rare that we really talk about their uh, charitable work or they just say, oh, he's pretty good charity. No, I don't. 
I just want to shout out Najee Harris. Keep doing what you're doing, bro. Um, I grew up, I grew up a little. <laughs> My living situation was kind of shaky, so I understand it. But uh, shouts out to you, Najee Harris. And, you know, I, I feel that that is something that needs to be uh, come out a lot more. It needs to be championed. It needs to be spotlighted a lot more. So shouts out to you, Najee Harris, and the governor of California. Hopefully they're able to uh, – because, of course, we know the homeless uh, crisis in California is – has skyrocketed, especially uh, thanks to COVID um, and the pandemic. So I just, I just, I, I, I'm proud of proud of Nashi Harrison, and I'm sure that whatever they, whatever they come up with or whatever he comes up with is definitely going to be monumental as far as changing California for the better. So. There you have it. That has been today's episode of the Unpopular Podcast. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. I thank you for the support. Uh, if you want an Unpopular Podcast shirt, hoodie, sweater, long sleeve, joggers, the link is in the description below. Any color you want. This is, was this, forest green? Any color you want, just click on the item. Look at the color. Press add to cart. Per, process now or buy now. Hey, I'm just... I'm walking you through it. Go get you some unpopular podcast merch. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm definitely trying to get to a thousand subscribers. So anything would help. I appreciate you guys. And I appreciate all the people that have subscribed and that are subscribed, are following me, uh, interact with me, say, hey, good job. Do this. You know, doing great. I appreciate you guys. It definitely keeps me going. Um, have a great day, man. And I will see you guys. What's Saturday? <laughs> Until next time, much love. Mm -hmm.